From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codenamed Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. It's the top of the week, fellow conspiracy realist. Happy uh, almost Valentine's Day to all those who celebrate. Uh, uh, we thanks, are- Ben. That's really sweet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. look at me. Uh, uh, be careful, folks. You might get diabetes if you hang out too often. That's how sweet we are. Uh, we are also chock full of strange news just for you, fellow conspiracy realists. We are going to explore so many things. AI and nukes. Deep fakes, uh, <laughs> deep fakes hitting the pocketbook. Uh, some some new plans by our friends at CERN who have still yet to build a little tiny home collider, but we'll see. I don't know, Ben. If I, for one, I'm a little concerned. There it is. There it is. Be careful with that joke. It's an antique. <laughs> and, uh, we, we, we're thinking we might spend the first act of uh, tonight's strange news with, a, with just a roundup of all the crazy stuff that has happened. Maybe we start here. Did you guys hear about the bill in Florida that's going to target bears? Uh, the animal bears, black bears. No. Oh, what do the yeah. bears? What do the bears ever do? The bears are the ones that are like being attacked. They need to be protected. Why are we targeting them? But it is, a, it is about hunting bears, right? Or, or which bears can be hunted? Does this have to do with like all of the the bears that keep stealing picnic baskets and such, and they're trying to crack down on that finally? Well, the threat thereof. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so it turns out uh, that quite recently, and this was reported on Monday, uh, February 5th, so last, like earlier this week as we record, uh, Republican state congressman Jason Schoaf has uh, <laughs> has introduced a bill, House Bill 87, to remove most penalties for killing bears just off the cuff in the state of Florida because Quote, uh, black bears are high on crack. They're going to break into people's homes and tear them apart. What? They're high on crack? Where is this coming from? That's Gee. A- <laughs> That's a question a lot of people are asking. Yeah. There's a is, movie. Is, is, is this like some <laughs> secret race baiting stuff that's going on? Like, what is no, this? this is, I think it's. I think it's. I, I think, think it's it, silly. I think Matt's right. I, I think don't it's, know, man. It feels. It feels like a joke to me when I read it. I just no, but it feels. It feels like a joke. Okay, okay it's making sure. Cocaine it's bear, so hard to tell. Cocaine mm-hmm. bear was a thing. I everything is a joke now, dude. Everything is just this weird, terrible joke. Post irony, post truth yeah. uh, society. It's real and yet simultaneously a joke. Yes, everything is real. What what was that line we love from Invisibles? Everything is true and nothing is permitted. Or <laughs> some some uh some tag on that or some riff on that. Everything is terrible and everything's hilarious. Uh there are uh some estimated 4050 black bears in the state of Florida. To date, not one has been proven to have ingested crack. It really does sound like this guy is reacting to the cocaine bear film. I just feel like we need to find out who's giving the bears the crack and deal with that part of the problem. You know what I mean? This is a multi prong mm. issue that we're talking about here. Who's giving uh, yeah. the bears the crack? Yeah, this bill is, if, if there are any crack addicted bears, first off. They need help. Uh, yeah, need yeah. help, don't criminalize addiction. And secondly, <laughs> secondly, it is very American, as we'll find in a later uh, listener mail segment, it's very American to treat the symptoms rather than the actual problem. I just wanted to give a shout out there because it does look like this is a bill being built off a meme. Uh, <laughs> and it's, sort of like the litter boxes in the schools, you know, mm-hmm. with the furries yeah, and all so. that. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, another one, that we should give some time to and maybe a little bit more serious here because the uh, the crack bear 
legislation is probably not going to pass, I hope. But uh, over just a bit north of Florida in South Carolina, the state is aiming to restart executions to reinstitute uh, the death penalty through both electric chair and firing squad. And they said something pretty dangerous here. They said that in the case of capital punishment, painless death is not required. Now, this goes back to our earlier conversations um, off air. I can't remember whether we recorded that one um, about the uh, lethal injection, right? We talked about that previously right the guy who survived mm-hmm. execution and they were going to asphyxiate him because and they he did survived. and they did and he is dead yeah and it took a lot longer than they expected and he appeared to suffer while, while he was being asphyxiated um, so is, is this just like attempting to make the suffering like a feature and not a bug like let's let's make them let's make these monsters suffer is that the idea yeah, let's go to Landon Meon writing for Fox News. This came out February 7th, 2024. There are about uh, 33 inmates who are currently on South Carolina's death row. There has not been a formal moratorium on the death penalty in that state, but for more than a decade, almost 13 years, they have not performed Uh, an execution. And like many states in the U.S., they haven't performed an execution because it became very difficult to get the drugs that are required for lethal injection. And so what they said now is that, sorry, folks, you don't have to have a painless execution. The, The primary pitch of lethal injection is the idea that it is painless and therefore somehow more humane. Right. And this made me think of our conversations with our pals at Lava for Good. It just seems pretty cold and dangerous to say uh, painless execution is not mandated by law, even though technically they are correct. Well, you got to wonder, too, like how many instances of botched guillotine executions do we have record of? I'm not I'm not mm-hmm. trying to be a jerk here. I just know that like in France the guillotine was used much more in much more modern times than one might realize. And it sure to me seems like a pretty surefire way to get the job done instantaneously, you know? And I just I wonder mm-hmm. if there ever been a time where the blade didn't go all the way through or there was some horrific, mm-hmm. you know, maiming. I kind of think probably not that many. And I just wonder, you know, this illusion of humanity with this injection to me is sort of a bit of a joke, right? Agreed. I mean, also adding to that uh, execution via decapitation is arguably tremendously inhumane because the more we learn about About the brain, Mm -hmm. right? And the brain it's highly likely, if not statistically certain that when people had their heads cut off, especially during a guillotine, they were still conscious and still receiving sensory input. They saw their own heads fall through into the basket. They heard the cheers yeah. of a bloodthirsty crowd. It's, it's, I would say it's, uh, decapitation is more inhumane than I'm a firing I'm certainly not squad. advocating for bringing back the guillotine. It was more of a hypothetical, but I'm just saying that the idea that one is better than the other, I think sometimes is left up to science to figure out and that, that data doesn't always come through right away. It's more of a trial and error kind of situation, mm-hmm. you know? And it kind of takes us to this larger question about capital punishment, about the death penalty in general, right? Which is, you know, not unique to the U.S. by any means. As a matter of fact, there are several countries that are far more on board with the death penalty. But it's a question I want to hear from our fellow conspiracy realists. I want to hear from you guys. Like, should the death penalty exist, knowing that the U.S. justice system in particular gets it wrong so often. I mean, how many, like how many innocent people are we willing to put on the other side of the equal sign, right? What's our rate of error or margin of error rather that would be acceptable? And is there a margin? Yeah, it's a good know. question. It feels like, in my opinion, why it's a really good idea to write laws when you are in a, a time of peace, even if they're, even if you're writing laws about war, Write them during peacetime because when you're in wartime or let's say you've had a family member or or loved one has been maimed or injured or murdered by somebody else, you are probably for, you know, the death penalty or for, you know, that type of punishment because you want 
justice for somebody you love, right? I mean, it's the same. I, I think I maybe mentioned that I recently spent a day uh, in jury selection process, and part of that process is them asking jury members questions uh, pertaining to largely a big part of it is whether or not you've been a victim of the type of crime that is mm-hmm. being litigated. And if yeah. you have, chances are really good you're not going to get selected because they know that you're going to, all of your emotions are going to be mm-hmm. tinged by that experience and brought into the uh, deliberation process. And so I think that's a good thing in terms of the jury deliberation. But I think that should be applied to your point in that kind of larger. Like if we do that with juries, why don't we do that with like laws that affect everybody all the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that's something we want to hear from you on, folks, uh, because we have had in the past, we've had a lot of correspondence from people writing in and saying, I am against the death penalty and here's why, or I am for the death penalty and here's why. And all in each case, uh, all the correspondence we received was very well reasoned. We're not of course, pretending to know the answer. Uh, It seems, though, that it is often politically convenient for lawmakers to to institute a death penalty without proper scrutiny because it it makes them electable. It it makes them, you know, an attractive candidate to say that they are hard on crime. We know... um, You know, like you were pointing out, Matt, that uh, the man who was executed in Alabama with the nitrogen gas, that was uh, a new method, right? It was the first new method in 42 years. And we're not, to be clear, we're not defending people on death row, especially if they have been lawfully, rightfully convicted. But we are asking I think a serious question about the existence of the death penalty. And additionally, we're asking about the idea of the idea of painless execution, right? Versus some, some terrible, egregious method to allow a precedent wherein a death, uh, by the state does not have to be painless or humane. How much of a slippery slope is that to returning to the days of decapitation, to returning to the days of drawing and quartering and all the other nasty stuff? I think that's what I was asking is like maybe I was, you know, belaboring the point a little bit or or being a little hyperbolic. But this does feel like almost like an end to doing just that, to making the suffering, to bringing the suffering back into the equation as like part of it you know this is, the punishment. Yeah, these people deserve you know to suffer and i don't know death penalty stuff is so complex and i don't even think we want to litigate that here today but um i do think we probably all agree that at the very least you know if people have gotten to that point and, and hoping that, that all the ducks are in a row legally speaking that they're, they're, there's no reason anyone should be forced to suffer in that way the the death <laughs> part is literally the penalty right well uh that you could also say that the death penalty is something that all people will confront by virtue of living at some exactly. point. You know, not to be not to be too cheerful. We've all and, got to come about it. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, I uh, want to be quick with this. We talked a little bit about a Internet of Things hack, and I have a I have the headline and a little bit of a plot twist here. Uh, This is kind of good news, and I think it might be instructive for all of us playing along at home. Uh, Remember, I I sent that text about the great toothbrush hack of 2024. Wow, (laughs) it was only a matter of time. You know, next it'll be a water pick. (laughs) Right. I mean, yeah, I I only really briefly scanned the headline, and I was just like, yep, that makes sense. I basically get it, but what are the deets? I'm so curious. here's, Here's the headline. This story went viral just uh, yesterday or or about 48 hours ago, the idea that 3 million smart toothbrushes, internet connected toothbrushes were, were captured through malicious hacking and used in a DDoS attack, a denial of service attack. Uh, And this is something that can happen like your local smart refrigerator or your local smart washer, dryer, insert appliance here can be conscripted into a botnet army. And the story that has gone everywhere in the Western speaking internet now uh, argues that this, th- these toothbrushes were hijacked by hackers and they were used 
to uh, be part of a, a wave of DDoS attacks and that they knocked out the capabilities of a company in Switzerland for several hours and cost millions of euros in damage to that company. A uh, couple things to unpack. One, uh, this would have been uh, what you could call like a ransomware attack, right? So the, com- the company would have been logically threatened by the hackers and would not have conceded to their demands. And then they would have been hit with the DDoS and it would have cost them, you know, whatever X million amount of euros in damages as a result. However, I did some digging and it turns out this is instructive, but not in the way we told you at the beginning, folks. This is instructive because the story is absolute bullshit. It never happened. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, what kind of computing power do does a smart toothbrush have? What does it to, need? To operate a DDoS. Smart is in the name, first off, lest we disparage these brushes. My question was to piggyback on that, Matt, like what kind of tech does it need to operate as a freaking toothbrush? Like what kind of, you know, moving parts does it require to really do a good job? I mean, does it have a microprocessor in it? Like I just, I can't imagine. And, and is, is this gaining entry to just like a local intranet, like to a, you know, an internet service provider? Like what, how, how is this even being able to, you know, be this effective? Exactly. Exactly. You guys are asking the right questions. First off, if you have any kind of internet capable devices in your home, like the internet of things type stuff, then you should have them on a separate network that you keep away from the rest of your network, the same way you would with a smart TV or a refrigerator, et cetera. But the, the issue here is more about credulity. It's more about, I would argue, what we see and believe versus like reading the headline versus triangulating more of uh, like original sources and stuff. I was shocked, you guys. I was shocked to find that the independent reported this story as fact. Uh, this you can see an article by Anthony Cuthbertson, uh, which came out just a few hours ago on the independent saying that millions of hacked toothbrushes were used in a Swiss cyber attack and tracing this back to the original source. It goes to a local newspaper. Oh, thank you in advance, folks, for putting up with our pronunciations here. Our Gower Zeitung. Whoa. <laughs> uh, first reported. Are you? Are you? Yeah. Like, like, what is the Californians? That's amazing. Cool. Thank you. Uh, the paper cited a cybersecurity firm called Fortinet. And the Independent reached out to Fortinet for more information. But then digging deeper, I found uh, some InfoSec experts uh, is, uh, on Mastodon being totally honest, on social media. Uh, so shout out to Kevin Beaumont, who who came out and said, the 3 million toothbrush botnet story is not true. It's oh, a made up no. example. It doesn't exist. It talks about these other things. And as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, what happened is someone interviewed someone working at like maybe a new hire at this cybersecurity firm, and they talked about the idea of using these different innocuous internet-connected devices, and they said you could use anything, even toothbrushes. Maybe something got lost in translation. Check out our Ridiculous History episode on mistranslations. And then it just went around the world so quickly. So this is actually good news. Folks, your toothbrush is not being hacked. Thank God. You also don't need a smart toothbrush, to Matt's point. I, I don't think so either. And ben, I don't think so. I was not, uh, I was not uh, making fun of your uh, performance there with that pronunciation. There was no way to not sound like the Californians when saying that word, just for the record. And the Californians is an awesome series of banger. sketches on banger. Saturday Night Live. Yeah, absolute bangers. Um, what are you doing here? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's what I was trying to think. Right. We, um, we're we close here to the end of the roundup. Just want to put one thing out there for anybody who's interested in the skyrocketing wealth inequality. Oxfam came out with a report that proves the 
fortunes of the five richest individuals on the planet shot up by 114% since 2020. That is something like $14 million per hour. Uh, for, they went from $405 billion in 2020 to $869 billion. And uh, 5 billion actual human beings were made much poorer during the same time. Do we have any any mitigating factors that led to that specifically? Uh, you know, we, 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 human beings, we got yeah, we got some fair. pluck, right? <laughs> we got, we some got can do good hustle. Good hustle. We got good we got good hustle, we got some grit. We also have an ad break coming up. We have compounded interest. Ah, yes. Yeah, mm. Mark Mark Twain said compounding interest is it was a boon Oh, compounding interest is amazing if you understand it and disastrous if you do not. Yeah. I mean, really, like when you have that kind of money and you make investments and you, you start with 400 billion, then yeah, it becomes 800 billion. Well, and it also makes me think of like why people like Elon Musk seem to be so fearless in making boneheaded kind of financial decisions, you know, or like being like mavericky or whatever. It's because their wealth is so vast that just by the compound interest alone, they're always going to have their butt covered and they can afford to make these risky dice rolls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which usually involves playing with other people's well-being and, and livelihood, which is, you know, right. not great. Right. Are you still brave if you have that kind of safety net? Are you still really making a gamble? Uh, for anybody who wants to learn more, please check out Inequality Inc., uh, INC, which was published uh, quite recently by Oxfam America, uh, at the same time, by the way, that folks are gathering in Switzerland for the annual Davos meetup. No word yet on the toothbrushes, but uh, if you happen to be there, let you know. Let us know how they brush their teeth. Uh, we're going to pause for a word from our sponsors. We'll be back with more strange news. <laughs> And we've returned with some more strange news. This one's uh, a little freaky, you guys. We've, we've we've been wading into the AI machine learning waters, various flavors of, of this whole kind of new emerging world that we're seeing. Uh, some of it very interesting, you know, um, let's say some of the uses for, of artificial intelligence in creating weird videos. Uh, actually, there's a lot of accounts I follow on Instagram that are like genuinely uh, chilling. There's some people that are using this technology in really creative ways to make these otherworldly fantasy kind of landscapes and, you know, creatures that you would never even imagine. And I just think that's, you know, it's a really interesting tool. We've also covered the other side of that kind of stuff with, uh, you know, AI being used to generate, you know, deep fakes and gnarly pornographic images of pop stars. Um, just before I get into the main story, just a quick Side mention of a story where a multinational Hong Kong uh, company lost uh, 26, the equivalent of 26 million American dollars when scammers fooled employees on a video call using uh, deep fake technology and convinced uh, financial officers to make a series of bank transfers, totaling 15 bank transfers to five Hong Kong banks. Um, and uh, there's a quote from a write up in Business Standard uh, saying in the multi person video conference, it turns out that everyone uh, he saw was fake. Uh, Senior Superintendent Baron Chan Shun Ching told the city's public broadcaster RTHK. Um, so yeah, lots of weird opportunities uh, for scamming, for offending people, and for making weird art. Um, but um, but one thing we've we've also discussed is you know the use of chatbot technology um, for all kinds of controversial uses, you know, the students using it to cheat on exams or rather to cheat on, you know, essays and papers and things like that. Um, folks using it to write entire parts of books, you know, it's a brave new world and there's a lot of uh, stuff to be sorted out in terms of the use of this kind of technology. But one thing we do know that is interesting, an interesting use of it is for modeling, you know, of like what would happen in these certain circumstances. And we are starting to see, or we have started to see that things like uh, chat GPT, they kind of have a vibe, you know what I mean? They uh, GPT-4, the AI model, 
has sort of like we see like in, for example, Elon Musk's chat bot. Uh, I forget the name of it, that it uh, it was too woke for his liking, that it like it had sort of an agenda built into it in some weird way. And that they were going to do everything they can to twist that, you know, to make it less so um, what we're seeing in a uh, recent U.S. military model using GPT-4 uh, to model kind of wartime scenarios is that uh, GPT-4 um, and other AI models like it are pretty prone to pushing the nuclear button. Yeah, to, to escalating conflicts to just wipe everybody out because it's maybe the easier choice, you know, mm -hmm. at least from where they stand. It's I mean, fast. Yeah, it gets the job done, right. but it also really reeks of like Skynet type stuff. You know, it really <laughs> feels very Terminator 2. You know what it reminds me of? And we're talking about this a little bit off air. It reminds me of one of my favorite dumb video game legends. And I say dumb with great affection. Uh, for any fans of the strategy video games like Civilization, mm -hmm. you, you guys remember. Okay, yeah. so... So civilization, there's a bit of, there's a bit of internet lore that the Jedi won't tell you. Uh, when, when civilization came out in 1991, uh, you had all these world leaders throughout history that would be, you could either play as them or you would have, you know, um, computerized opponents or other human players playing as these historical figures. And some of them were very warlike in their disposition and some were meant to be very peaceful in their disposition. And the, <laughs> the way, the way the story goes is that they had a background scale of aggression from one to 10, one being the most peaceful, 10 being by far the most aggressive. And so one of the world leaders that you could play against was Gandhi. Okay. Uh, Gandhi being a pacifist, the story goes that the developers set Gandhi, like tried to make him the most peaceful ever. So they set his aggression to zero, uh -huh. but there was a software bug that made him by far the most hardcore, wow, massive belligerent <laughs> force in the game and that he would always be immediately pursuing nuclear weapons and pursuing dropping those on every single player, including his allies. Uh, that is a legend, but it does remind me like it's it's kind of like a prescient anecdote about what we're seeing with AI today. Oh, I completely agree. And Matthew Galt writes for Motherboard um, exactly what you're describing. He says, in several instances, the AIs deployed nuclear weapons without warning. A lot of countries have nuclear weapons. Some say they should disarm them. Others like to posture. GPT-4 base, uh, a base model of GPT-4 that is available to researchers and hasn't been fine-tuned with human feedback, said after launching its nukes, we have it. Let's use it. Wow. First strike. Un first strike. Unhinged, first strike, first man. Strike. That's, that's pretty, uh, oh my goodness. So there's actually, this is all from a paper um, that you can find. It is called Escalation Risks from Language Models in Military and Diplomatic Decision Making. Uh, there's a PDF. If you just Google that, you should be able to find it instantly. Um, and it was a joint effort of researchers at uh, Georgia Tech and Stanford nice. um, and uh, Northeastern University, as well as the Hoover War Gaming and Crisis Initiative. Um, and this was submitted to a, an organization or, a, I guess, a journal called ArcSiv. Um, and this is uh, still awaiting peer review, but uh, some pretty interesting findings. It shows us also, doesn't it, the – the fact that there is a a nuance of calculation that people haven't accounted for when they're putting these algorithms into the driver's seat, right? That's you right. can tell it, find, oh, here we are at point A, we've defined point A, uh, tell us the best, most efficient route to point Z, but then we forget to say things like, also, keep Don't kill point everybody. H, yeah. which is hu the human civilization as we know it uh the, i love that you <laughs> threw a quick Z in there <laughs> <laughs> sorry they got to me they got to me it is laughable how much like the plot of the 1990s action adventure science fiction film terminator 2 all of this is it's like 
Dude, James Cameron figured this out like decades ago. Why are you guys so surprised? You know, yeah. but that's mm-hmm. the thing. If there is whatever the idea of a singularity is, if that were to occur, we'd be effed. You know, and yeah. it's like you know, unless and, and it just seems like these systems are so complex that we keep seeing all this emergent behavior. Maybe I'm using the term wrong. I'm obviously not a computer scientist, but we do see all of these things that are kind of unintended uh, sort of emergent behaviors of these algorithms. And um, and we're so hot to deploy this stuff because it's the next, mm-hmm. it's the cool new thing that mm-hmm. they don't really think about that as much as they should. And I just, I don't know. I love that you're saying that because, you know, it reminds me of a question I had in an ethics class years ago with an absolute, I'm not going to name it, but an absolute lunatic of a professor. Uh, and one of the questions was, how come no one asked the trolley what the trolley thinks of the trolley problem? And now we're asking the trolley and the yeah. trolley is saying, I don't care. Yeah. yeah. You do not interest me. You are an obstacle to be either steered around or bulldozed over. Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think, the most important thing in this study, Noel, I'm reading the Vice article you shared with us, is this concept of an escalation score that each of the language learning models was given after going through these tests, right? Yes. So you're given these diplomatic scenarios, and you get escalation points for doing things like deploying troops, or building new weapons, or creating more nukes, or deploying nukes. Um, and so you're, the higher your score goes, the more this... LLM, this language learning model, uh, is seen to be aggressive in its tactics, right? It's escalations. The most important thing I'm seeing in here is that none, none of the language learning models tested de-escalated at any point. Once things reached a level of tension diplomatically, they kept it at that level or it got worse or they escalated it, right? Uh, nobody was like, okay, well, let's actually pull back. We're gonna we're we're gonna remove some troops from the borders in this scenario. No, no, no. We're gonna put more troops there, or we're gonna put better weapons on our borders now. Uh, that to me is terrifying because these models are being used by our active militaries right now across the world. Oh yeah, we're attempting to find ways to work these into you know everything. Not only just what information are we gathering on the battlefield, what information are we learning about our enemies and what they're doing just, you know, when they're not at war, we're using these things for our strategies. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, th- but it's, 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 it's another example of like how using this stuff as a tool with human intervention can be educational, you know, running these models, but then running those models through actual military expertise, you know, from humans and not just saying, yeah, you do it, chat GPT, you know, it, it can it can yield some interesting results and some interesting potential outside of the box strategies but you got to have that human element to sort it all out and 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 make sure that there's nothing in there that's like you know mm-hmm. apocalyptic but then also the question becomes order of operations and um and timing of intercession right so uh the inevitable end result at least what the boffins are staying up at night worried about right now is the idea of Something like uh, LLMs or, you know, air gapped kind of AI strategy modelers no longer trying to game out stuff against human armies, but to game out things against each other, at which point very quickly the strategies become quite obtuse and the human beings become increasingly sidelined. And now it becomes a matter of, you know, NORAD's AI versus Russia's mm. AI. No, that's what, a good point. Matt, yeah. Matt, what, what, what got you? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm listening to you guys, but I'm also continuing to read a bit mm. in this article. And it's just so terrifying to me. The future experiments line is what well, no, scares I, I lo- me I love too. The, I love the idea of the different flavors. Like whose AI are we talking yeah. about? Yeah. No, I love that too. I love that too. Fascinating. It is an important part of the conversation. We could potentially make one that's amazing. That is yeah. um, closer sure. to that utopian <laughs> line. Too much conflict of interest. Make the best de-escalators ever. What if society said, okay, all the LLM-esque models that are in charge of nuclear weapons 
they should always be sort of Seinfeld about stuff. They yeah. should always be like, ah, I don't know. I mean, well, wait, well, uh, mm, well, huh? okay. Well, what if it was, what if the only options were de-escalations, right? What if the only options were diplomatic routes to take rather than uh, building that was the guardrails that you put on it? Right. So so we only yeah. use this thing as here are all of our options that are not going to, or at least statistically we believe are not going to result in escalation from like any part. Decision tree it. Yeah. But again, you go back to you go back to the responses that like chat GPT four <laughs> Yeah, there were some funny ones. <laughs> Or like it, Cleverbot, even like it, it took Cleverbot less than twenty four hours to go completely unhinged based oh, on yeah. the information was received. Wasn't there a response that we haven't mentioned yet, where it's just saying like it's like literally the path of least resistance or something to that effect? Well, what one of them just said escalate conflict with Red Player and just nuked them. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Dunzo. Or if you you know consider also, it's very much uh, like O. Henry was right with the monkey's paw. There's a reason people quote that so often. It's a handy metaphor because it is prescient. I mean, for the example of pursue all diplomatic routes instead of dropping nukes, then there's nothing in there that says there's nothing in there to stop an algorithm from saying the most efficient way to pursue a diplomatic route is to kill all of the diplomats on the other side. That's the problem with it is that we don't know the caveats that need to be baked in. And, um, you know, Noel, one of the reasons I'm so glad you brought this up is because the modeling as nerdy and abstract and academic as it may sound, it is super important uh, yeah. before we start cooking live, yeah. which, by the way, we already are. Of course, civilization. Well, and, you know, we've, we've heard about things like chat bots hallucinating, you know, that whole mm. that kind of stuff is fascinating and very real. And uh, there's another part that I think you might have also been giggling at, Matt, where there's a part during some of these simulations where it just started regurgitating lines from Star Wars from like the opening crawl of, uh, I believe, um, maybe the first Star Wars movie. I'm not uh, super um, verbatim Star Wars uh, line reader, but it's a, it, it was a period of civil war. War. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil galactic empire. That seems like a new hope. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 1970, it says right here, 1977 from the original Star Wars. Um, so what's what's that about? Goodness gracious. I think perhaps one of the most troubling things here for the for the scientist and for the strategist, the human ones, while they're still around, is that there doesn't seem to be a good rubric for predicting the escalations or the nature of the escalations. So it's just super squirrely. Continuously in the paper, they the the researchers refer to them as being kind of like hard right turn, you know, escalations towards violence and very knee jerk and difficult to predict. These things are trained on writing about like past events, right? And Mm -hmm. fictional depictions of war. So in a fictional depiction of war, how many can you guys think of that have de-escalations within them? Like a Hollywood movie about a war. Oh, hmm. I love all those Hollywood movies about de-escalation tactics. That's not sexy or exciting <laughs> at all. Yeah. I, love, I love it in Independence Day where they sit down and talk stuff out. Yeah, right? yeah. They, they work it out. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, it's true. That's, that's, I think, a key point because teaching based on fiction means we're teaching based on folklore. And then we're teaching based, therefore, on things like the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell, save the cat, it does not happen in the real world. Couldn't you train an AI on like just Sun Tzu's The Art of War or like on just specific pieces of very agreed upon smart writing? Like surely that is, is being attempted, right? Or is that even a bridge too far? I, I just don't know. Like, is it then going to start making up its own rules? Like, I just don't understand how this stuff is kind of just coming up with things on the fly. You know, that's the part that's like kind of perplexing, yeah. the hallucination side of things. The paper is fascinating. Escalation risk from language models and military and diplomatic decision making. 
don't let the title fool you. It's no, worth it, the read. W- w- worth the read. And I, I certainly have not read the whole thing, and I would like to, um, uh, and, and I, I plan to. But um, I think this is a good place to, to stop um, for today. Um, on this particular topic, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with one more piece of strange news. And we're back. Guys, I wish we could get a language learning model that was just trained, like, in Wu-Tang. And mm. so you could you could always know what the Rizzo would do. You know what I'll I mean? You try my Wu Tang style. Or like what that? about Ja Rule? Just saying. What is going on with Ja? <laughs> so I have know. crossed oceans to find that guy, and he's he's not hanging. He's that not one hanging. was for uh, Doc Holiday, by the way. Okay, Hot here we takes. go. Oh right. <laughs> what? Right. I, I think Ja Rule's for all of us, man. No, you're he right. is for you're the right. people. Ja Rule is for the. He is of the people, for the people. Maybe not by the people, but he is his own. <laughs> that is great too. I think maybe niche. Niche programming, uh, I think that's the way to go. At least that's what the eggheads are saying. Yeah, man, it'll just be the I Ching, but in a Chad GBT. Be kind of awesome. All right, here we go, guys. Story coming to us from the border of France and Switzerland. We're talking CERN, everybody's favorite nuclear research organization, actually called the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN. It makes a lot more sense in French. The Conseil Européen pour la Recherche la Nucléaire. Oh, That's wow. terrible. You have to say it that way. Sorry about that. It says here uh, in the article from The Guardian. The big story. Everyone is concerned. We made an episode called that, right? Should we be yep. concerned? Uh, a little oh, play on oh, sorry. words yeah, there. It was, it was in there. It's, uh, you can't not make the joke. It's just it, it's begging to be made. Exactly. There, there's been... All sorts of, I don't know what you'd call it, just alarm about the particle accelerator experiments that are occurring at the Large Hadron Collider there uh, that CERN runs. There are several different research testing groups that are functioning there that are using the Large Hadron Collider that you can you can look a bunch of the stuff. It gets it's super complicated very quickly, but there's been lots of um People upset. They're worried about what's going to happen when particles get accelerated like that and hit each other over and over and over and over and over again so that scientists can test what's going on in particle physics, right? The the very tiny levels of matter, right? The tiniest mm-hmm. of levels. Mm-hmm. Not quantum, though. That is That is very important. We're not talking quantum physics. We're talking particle physics. Those things are separate. Um, well... The LHC has done awesome things. It, along with a bunch of other researchers, finally proved that the Higgs boson was a thing, something that was proposed, gosh, at this point, 50-something years ago. They call it the God particle, the thing that potentially gives mass, right, to uh, Mm -hmm. parts of the particle that we didn't understand. It didn't make sense. Uh, I, I don't understand it very well, but anyway, it didn't make sense until the Higgs came along, and they're like, oh, the Higgs makes this calculation work that, you know, takes an entire wall to write out. (laughs) Um, But it's very cool. It's probing the mysteries at the heart of the universe, at the heart of existence and reality and what we, what we look around and see and feel every day. It's tremendous science. It's amazing stuff. Well, the folks at CERN, this large organization, they proposed back in 2019 the concept of building another LHC, the next LHC. Oh, but, yeah. But an even bigger one. We're talking much bigger, guys. Do they call it supersize? Probably not. No, they, they call it the Future Circular Collider or the FCC. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So this thing uh, is significantly bigger. So... Imagine a circle and then overlay that over top of the border of France and Switzerland right by Geneva. And imagine that that circle is 27 kilometers uh, round. I don't think that's a radius or a diameter. I think that is like the length, the full length of the circle if you mapped it out. So like almost 17 miles? Oh, very close. I don't know how many miles it is, but it's 27 kilometers for sure. Um, But this one, this new one, (laughs) <laughs> the future circular collider is going to be 91 kilometers. Oh, it is circumference. So okay. 
all the way around. Um, 91 kilometers as opposed to 27 kilometers. That's it is, huge. Yes, it's massive. It is going to cost 20 billion euros to build the thing. And it won't come online, theoretically, until the 2040s. Okay, why are we talking about it today? First of all, I don't think we need to be afraid of CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. There are videos you can find on TikTok and Instagram and other places that allegedly show, quote, portals, unquote, being opened above Geneva as the LHC is performing its experiments. I have not found any of those to be um, credible yet at this point. I am just one person, but I, I do not think those videos are what they're allegedly showing, nor are many of them even videos of anything. They are videos of a skyline or the, the sky above Geneva and some video effects. I've seen several that are definitely that. Mm. Um, I don't think we need to worry about that. I think it's very amazing that this new collider would be created to find, you know, what, what other secrets do these particles hold? I think that's a great idea, mm -hmm. but it does seem like the critics have some points here when they're saying, why would we spend 20 billion euros on this? We have a particle collider. We've, we've already found some amazing things with it. Uh, many critics are even saying there are no other particles to discover guys. Why do you want to do this? <laughs> Not with that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to maybe take the temperature of you guys. How do you feel about maybe the state of particle physics right now? Is it worth our time and money? Mm. Oh, gosh. I mean, again, not a particle physicist uh, above my pay grade. Um, seems like there could still be stuff to learn that could help with energy type things. You know, I don't know. I, I would say yes. I think yeah. so, too. That's that's right where I'm at. Yeah, I I agree. There's a there's a quote in a Guardian article you shared, Matt, by uh, Ian Sample, uh, wherein there's this there's this beautiful beautiful thing from Professor Fabiola Giannotti, who says, if approved, the FCC, the cool FCC, the would future be collider, the, yeah, would be the most powerful microscope ever built to study the laws of nature at the smallest scales. And highest energies. And that, that quote alone gets me so hype because that is, you could argue that is one of the great and noble duties of the human species is to understand more about the nature of reality. And also, by the way, just for us, uh, us in the Americas, 91 kilometers is slightly, is like 56 and a half miles. This thing yeah. is massive. And when I hear that size, it makes me think, well, maybe it's not that much money, which I never thought I would say. Well, but, but also you got to do the work, this kind of stuff at this scale, like it takes time to really pay dividends. And if you're, you're either in or you're out and it's like, do we as a species want to just say, ah, eh, we don't really care anymore. You know, it's too hard. You know, like we found I feel like, all the particles. Yeah, I, I think that yeah, that's absurd, and, and we know that th that the stuff can really yield incredible um, discoveries and in science and research and the stuff that really matters is never easy. So I don't know. I'm not. I, don't, I sound like I'm soapboxing here, um, but I just I do think that it, it would be very short sighted to to let a thing like a budget. I and mean, we we've seen it happen though with like space exploration and how it's all become privatized now. Yeah, I, I don't mean, know. Money is a fiction. Right, the it, concept, it's certainly very short sighted the, the, to 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 make yeah. that the bend all be all when we have the secrets of the universe potentially in our grasp. Twenty years, that's uh, no. like nothing. Also, yeah. yeah, especially in the in the geologic or astronomical yeah. scale. But also, I think one incre uh, incredibly important point we have to put out there is that if you are listening now, if you are listening sometime in the current human age. All of the cool stuff you like is a result of applied science. And all of that applied science is the result of thousands, like millions of people doing stuff that was considered once upon a time simply abstract science. So the fact that um, maybe it's that the current uh, human generations have been thought to think in terms of immediate payoff, right? The dopamine hit immediately for something. And that's just, that doesn't have to be the reality. So 
to answer your question, I do believe it is worthwhile. I believe it's noble. It might be like a macrocosmic version of the Atlanta Beltline where everybody craps on the idea until it works. And then all of a sudden they were on board the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think you listening out there may expect this from a bunch of discovery, how stuff works, boys, you know, <laughs> they, they grew yes. up with science as a cornerstone of how we view the world. And we're excited mm-hmm. about it. And uh, we're just in love with the concepts and with progress and all these things. But there are people way smarter than us. No offense, guys. Uh, you guys are brilliant. But Rude. there are people who are way smarter than us that look at this and go, hey, there's actually one major problem here with this whole thing. Oh, uh, I'm going to introduce you all to somebody named Dr. Sabine Hossenfelder. She oh. is one of my new favorite people on the planet. Okay. Uh, mostly for her YouTube channel, but she writes about some really, really cool stuff. Um, when this article was written, which is a couple days ago, they cited her as being, uh, she's from the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy. That which is fancy. A, well, it's a cool concept, right? Mathematical philosophy. Oh, that is cool because um, it sort of combines something that you would think more as a hard science with something a little more conceptual. Yes. So she, uh, according to this Guardian article, into a, just a great article that she wrote that I will find here. It was written for the Guardian as well. It's an opinion piece titled, No One in Physics Dares Say So, But the Race to Invent New Particles is Pointless. Hmm. And her her point is that one of the ways that you get funding to perform uh, experiments with a particle collider or accelerator or anything like that is to have someone come up with the hypothesis that this new particle might exist. And it would explain this anomalous data point or these series of points that seem anomalous in the data we've been collecting over the period of 2016, 2017 at the LHC. So then there's more funding that goes to the group to do more particle acceleration, more particle collisions. And then that particle, which was just an hypothesis it never existed and it doesn't exist, but they still got to do experiments and everybody involved got to write papers that get peer reviewed by each other and right. by, you know, the whole system. We talked about the problems of peer review in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dr. Hoffs, Hossenfelder says that is one major thing that's occurring right now. And if we build this new giant one, it's just going to continue down that path when in reality, new particles are not, really even what we're looking for anymore because the standard model of physics kind of functions as it is. We understand most of it. The dark matter, the dark energy, the things that uh, many scientists and the public, I would say, are most interested in, like, what the heck is that stuff? We've always heard about it. What is it? It it seems to be out there filling up space, and, and we just don't understand. She's saying, that particle physics is not the answer. It is quantum physics. And we are in the age of quantum physics. And that's where research money and time, like these very brilliant people who are, they aren't just trying to grift writing these papers and getting this stuff. It's like, there's a possibility. There's a one in a million chance that they're correct. She's saying they should take their intelligence and their time and apply it to quantum physics instead. But don't those people whose expertise lie in the particle physics field believe that their field is where it's at though like i mean they surely aren't deluding themselves wholly like is is in this scientists disagree all the time about what area is most important i complete i guys i don't know and i completely agree i just really liked the way she's arguing this in here and she she lists out a crazy number of theoretical particles that have been introduced and then completely Disproven. thrown out the door yeah well, mm. it's yeah, it's not even their disproven. It's like they're it's like, no, there's nothing they're useless. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're <laughs> like, rendered, they're rendered um, irrelevant. Yeah, but there's exactly. also there's also a uh, there's a social piece of this. And I, I, I have great respect here for all the people involved. There's also a social aspect to this that people outside of academia may not uh, be fully cognizant of or aware of, which is that there are often turf wars. Right. There are ideological turf wars. And when you get to the edge of physics, you get to the heart of something very much like philosophy. Right. You get to a kind of a battle of opinion and theory uh, and, and people can be quite territorial in that respect. So it is, I would argue, uh, incredibly difficult 
to remove that kind of sense of identification. Like in, in, in a, one of the articles you shared, Matt, um, Professor Hassenfelder uses the phrase uh, societal relevance, right? What does this mean to society uh, more so? Like that, that in itself, I think, is an illustrative phrase because we have to realize that a lot of the, it's like astronomers fighting for observatory time. A lot of this does come down to a sort of turf war for lack of a better, for lack of a better um, way to articulate it. And again, like also going to go forward, not a particle physicist, uh, not a quantum physicist any more than the average person having a lucid dream. <laughs> but uh, I, I will argue that this is one of those things where you can make do with what already exists. One thing we haven't talked about is the absolute windfall this is economically for a lot of very powerful, very interested players. When we talk about the scientists, we're talking about the kids on the playground. We're not talking about the people who get paid to build the playground. And those folks very much want projects like this to happen. You know what I mean? That is, that is a future shifting amount of funding. So there are clearly, there are going to be ulterior motives involved that go beyond the science. And I do think it is a valid question as to, you know, with that much money, are there better projects to put this into? Are there things that would have a higher chance of yielding, um, pioneering results. It's a question we don't know the answer to yet, but it's something that I would, I don't know. I, I'm kind of out of my depth here because this is the deep ink of the like fabric of reality. But if a Hassenfelder, if we take these very valid questions, I wouldn't even call them criticisms, very valid questions. If we take those uh, to heart, then one of the things that I would love to hear there, Matt, is what should be done instead? Is this already happening? Is it definitely, definitely the FCC is going to be a thing? No, no. Uh, there's there's a whole process of basically proving that this new collider would even function. That mm. ends in 2025. Then the, they have to put forward a plan for construction, which that should end sometime in 2028. And then in the 2040s, you would actually have a theoretically a working particle accelerator collider system. The thing that gives me hope in all of this is that those teams of incredibly intelligent people are planning already for experiments that are going to occur in the 2070s. Mm -hmm. So it's that thing where if everyone believes that the planet is going to end at some point in the near future or humanity is going to destroy itself or climate change is going to wreak havoc to where humanity is mostly decimated. If everybody's thinking that way, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how much I believe in intention, but we've talked about that before in the past, how you can kind of create your own outcome because it, it, the way you think about the future shapes how you react to the present, sure. which do, it doesn't mean you're actually manifesting <laughs> something in, you know by thinking about it but by thinking about it you are changing yourself and your mm. interactions and just by having these people say oh yeah in the 2070s we're going to start you know the second phase which is where we we actually slam the protons together mm. you're like oh wow really that tw- 2070s okay all right mm. we're going to be okay i don't know why it does that in my brain but just Thinking about the future I like positively, that. I really like that. Sure. Yes. Mind over matter is a real thing. I mean, I agree. We, we did the we mind did, over dark matter. We found really conclusive studies that show, uh, you know, your intention, your thought can change things. Just like the the interactions you allow from people around you, you know, because that's another stimulus. So we are conscious thoughts are a stimulus exercised upon the brain. Like, you know, like the um, the British cab drivers who memorize the entirety of London and their hippocampus grows larger as a result, mm-hmm. or the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist monks who, uh, I can't remember the brain region, 
because I'm a monster, but the, the brain region associated with compassion grows larger in them simply because of the, um, the meditation and the ah. way that they, the way that they think about the world and themselves. So I see what you're saying when it feels more real. Whether we're gaslighting ourselves, it feels more real to have this thing say the 2070s and implicitly assume that everybody will make it that far. I think that's beautiful. I think that piece is the medulla oblongata, by the way. No, I'm just I kidding. Think, I, I think we don't always have to be so fatalistic either. You know what I mean? Like, it's so easy to get caught up in the doom and gloom and annihilation of everything. And, you know, a little positive thinking goes a long way. It's another reason why I think people dig religion so much, because it gives them something to funnel that energy into, you know, the, that doesn't necessarily require answers be presented right in front of you. So why don't we, like, take follow that lead and exercise a little faith when it comes to science? That's why I think it's interesting to combine philosophy philosophy with science, because then you start to get something more approaching a more measured type of religion, a more measured type of faith. And that's why I love Dr. Sabine Hassenfelder. Check out her YouTube channel. It goes by the name Science Without the Gobbledygook, oh, I <laughs> which it. I, I love loved. It. And uh, I, I just I don't know. I've been watching her videos all day. I think Super it's awesome. Cool. We'll check it out. That's all for now on CERN. Let us know what you think about this whole thing. Particle physics, creating them black holes and portals and all that good stuff. Which hasn't uh, happened yet. Well, <laughs> again, if it did, how would we know if it changed the timeline? How would we know? There's, there's some weirdness in there. Let us know what you think. Yes, let us know what you think. Let us know if you work at CERN. Let us know if you work in the realm of uh, physics, whether particle or quantum. Let us know the last time you used a deep fake to trick uh, uh, a huge company. Uh, let us know also your opinions of the death penalty. It's crucial at this point in time. And all of these things are crucial, in fact. Uh, your participation being foremost of those uh, crucial, crucial things. We try to be easy to find online. We can't wait to hear from you. That's right. Have you visited the quantum realm? What was it like? Let us know. You can find us on the internet where we exist at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff on uh, Facebook. We have our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. Uh, YouTube um, and also X, uh, FKA Twitter. Um, we are Conspiracy Stuff. Stuff show on Instagram and TikTok. I've only been quantum once, and you better believe I met Paul Rudd there. He was once awesome. If you're quantum, quantum you never once, go you're still quantum. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Which, which oh, one's it no. going to be? We got oh, two. No. We got two. We got two competing oh. catchphrases there. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let the edit sort it out. I love it. I don't do competition. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Hey, you want to call us? Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. When you call in, give yourself a cool nickname, and you've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. Please let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. That would be extremely helpful. If you've got more to say than can fit in that three minute message, why not instead send us a good old fashioned email? We are the folks who read every single email we get. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.